singularity. So I'm here with uh, a person who does need no introduction in the community of artificial intelligence for the simple reason that many people have called him the father of artificial intelligence. And I'm incredibly happy and very excited to welcome Dr. Marvin Minsky on Singularity One on One. It's honor. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, so, Dr. Minsky, I, my goal here is to ask you, hopefully, some questions that you haven't been asked too often before. So, let me see if I will be successful in this attempt of mine or not by starting in this way. Can you perhaps share with us the personal story of how you got interested in artificial intelligence and why? Well, when I was a young student, <coughs> I found a book called My Mathematical Biophysics in Widener Library. And this was a wonderful book of essays by a scientist named Nicholas Ryshevsky. And it was a collection of little mathematical theories about various aspects of biology. And each of these essays took some biological phenomenon like cell division or um, metabolism or function of some particular kind of cells like connections between neurons and so forth and made a miniature mathematical theory of some aspect of, of that biological phenomenon. And each chapter took some completely different uh, biological subject and made some assumptions about what was going on, replaced each assumption by a mathematical uh, equation or postulate, and uh, then solved that set of equations and predicted some particular effect or phenomenon. So each chapter was a beautiful little self-contained way of understanding some phenomenon. And as a child, I had been interested in mathematics and science and many things like that, but I had never seen them all put together in such clear and uh, unambiguous ways. Now, each of these theories is presumably uh, correct in some aspects and completely wrong in others because it's an oversimplification. But I thought it was beautifully done and um, some of the chapters were by other people than Ryshevsky and by a wonderful set of accidents I met virtually all the people who had um, contributed to that uh, collection of uh, studies in the next few years. This was just shortly after World War II. I went to, to um, college in 1946, which was just after the, I spent a year in the, in the Navy in 1945, but the war ended then and uh, that ended with me being admitted to Harvard and um, meeting all the wonderful people who had been displaced from Europe during World War II. So there were a great many uh, great scientists in, in that area. And over the next few years, I met many of these great people. I had lunch with Einstein and Gödel and Robert Oppenheimer and uh, many people who figured in the second half of the 20th century science. That must have been absolutely amazing experience to get to meet Einstein and Gödel and Oppenheimer and all those people. Yes, and it seemed like an everyday event 
for someone living at Harvard and MIT and Princeton and sort of I spent many years shuttling between these mm -hmm. institutions and talking to those people. Mm -hmm. So how did you make the jump from mathematics and biology and interested in sort of how the brain works to your consequent interest in artificial intelligence or what came to be known later as artificial intelligence? Well, it was the same thing all along because in this first book by Ryshevsky, there were many little theories, particularly a little paper by McCulloch and Pitts on how neurons could compute various things and how they might learn in one or two different ways. And uh, given that start, it was easy to imagine other ways to, to that things like neurons could learn. I started to make my own theories of this, and um, then I got interested in the question of uh, how did neurons actually work. And uh, one problem was that uh, there was no uh, way in the late 1940s and early 1950s to observe these things very well. And uh, in the hope of uh, seeing what's going on better, I started to invent new kinds of microscopes and I spent a couple of years um, developing that sort of thing. I invented the confocal microscope, which was an instrument that had a higher resolving power than the machines available of those times. And uh, by the time I finished it, I got more interested in the theories of how the nervous system worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made one set of pictures of a few neurons and uh, never turned the machine on again, even <laughs> though I had spent a couple of years making it work. So let me ask you this. Was your primary motivation to figure out a way to put all of the different pieces together, or was it something else? It was... At the beginning, I thought, as many people did, that understanding how neurons work would be the first thing to do, and then you would put those ideas together and figure out how larger and larger parts of the brain work until you ultimately, someday in the distant future, you'd understand the whole thing. And then fairly suddenly, um, it seemed to me that many people had tried that and that the current theories in the 1950s were, if anything, worse than the ones in the 1860s and 70s. <laughs> and uh, I ran across the writings of uh, several theorists. William James had theories. The early Freud had had an uh, interesting theory of how neur neurons learned, which didn't actually ever get published till 1950, because uh, you know, nobody in the, I think he wrote the Project for a Scientific Psychology in 1895, around then, and he couldn't get anyone to publish it. Mm -hmm. And it was finally published in 1950, and it was full of interesting ideas about how neurons might learn. And um, <clears throat> let me ask you this: perhaps you can tell us. I mean, I was very impressed and very struck by, you know, the accomplishment of your students and uh, the obvious impact that you have had on their life. People, the, the two people present on our conference here, ISTAS 2013, uh, Raymond Kurzweil and Steve Mann. But I want to ask you from your own point of view, what's the thing that you're most proud of as your accomplishment that you hold dearest? Well, maybe the... I wrote a review of theories called Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence around 1970. And that sort of charted several possible lines of research, mm -hmm. 
which uh, pretty much predicted what what uh, several communities of researchers would do in the next 20 years. Uh, those predictions started to fall apart around, so that paper was 1970, roughly, and by the late 1980s, the world had changed, and it was interesting because when I started research in that, that general area, almost all of my students soon became professors. <laughs> maybe 70 or 80 percent of them uh, became graduate students, wrote theses. Um, these became pretty influential and they got appointments in the universities and started their own research groups. So up to the 1970s and 80s, this was a, this field called artificial intelligence kept developing. Somehow, um, by 1980, though, the opportunities for starting new research groups in that area declined. And one reason is that, at least in the United States, there's no age limit on professors. And, but more serious was that uh, most of this research had been financed by imaginative uh, leaders in the Defense Department, particularly in the Office of Naval Research which had an almost continuous inheritance of, of uh, scientifically oriented uh, commanders of various sorts. Um, you could go all the way back to, to Hermann Weyl, who was a great mathematical physicist who taught Einstein uh, the theory of tensors which enabled Einstein to make his theories of relativity and gravitation. And uh, Hermann Weil's son, Joe, Joachim Weil, was in the Office of Naval Research in the 1940s and was partly responsible for uh, uh, helping uh, scientists escape from Hitler, Hitler's uh, empire in Europe in the um, late stages of World War II and exporting them to Harvard and Princeton and uh, places, MIT and places like that, uh, where I met most of them as a young student. So it's sort of interesting phase of history where these uh, mm -hmm. great refugees accumulated and partly because of this accidental connection with the military. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, in the uh, later 1970s and 80s, uh, some liberal politicians in the United States uh, decided that it was kind of immoral for the military to be doing basic research when they should be uh, paying more attention to killing people, which was their official job. And this wonderful uh, system of supporting basic science and research literally fell apart in the United States so that by 1980, as I was saying, in the 1960s, all of my students virtually became professors and did basic research. By the 1980s, virtually none of them because the American universities had stopped expanding because there was very little uh, basic research money, which had been uh, coming from the military. Mm -hmm. And civilian money was never very good at basic research. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's not really true. The great monopolies like IBM and Bell Labs, mm -hmm. particularly, uh, had been able to do basic research because they had very little competition. But as the uh, anti-monopoly laws became stronger and the liberals uh, got more power than the capitalists, the quality of basic science declined. It's a paradox that very few people understood while it was happening.
That's a very interesting story about how funding for artificial intelligence got scarce. But let me ask you, um, do you have personally any mistakes that you regret doing in any of your long and profound career that you think that if you were doing today, you would have done differently? Can't think of any offhand, but there must be quite a few. But. <clears throat> For example, any with the with the theory of uh, of, of mind or um, um, artificial intelligence and the potential routes to to accomplishing that. No, I think I made some strategic mistakes. Um, my first uh, book about artificial intelligence uh, was a book called The Society of Mind, mm -hmm. and it had one-page chapters. And this book was very influential because uh, it had the feature that if you didn't understand one of these chapters, you could just skim it, and it wouldn't matter very much. Oh. And the result was that uh, great numbers of high school students understood most of the theories and uh, knew more than their professors did when they got to college. And uh, then I wrote a second book called The Emotion Machine, uh, which had longer, more conventional chapters. And it has slightly better theories, uh, but they're much harder to understand because I didn't break them into tiny portions. So that was, I think, a mistake, and I hope to write a third book which simplifies the later theories so that more younger people can understand them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Um, once you said that science fiction writers are the unacknowledged engineers of our world, would you mind elaborating a little bit on that, on the importance of science fiction in general and perhaps on your worldview or, or pursuit of artificial intelligence in particular? Well, when I was a child, I ran across various books and one of the most influential was a <clears throat> book of short stories by H.G. Wells, which may be 20 different stories in which <clears throat> he makes some hypothesis of, like somebody inventing anti-gravity. And as soon as you invent anti-gravity, you can make an uh, inexpensive spaceship and go to the moon and find out what's there and stuff like that. And each of these H.G. Wells stories has some good idea, which uh, won't work, but opens up some possibilities. and. Uh, there was Jules Verne in 1900, and... Um, what do you think of uh, stories like Frankenstein, which are often given as an example of the fact that we should be meddling with certain things because we are going to be playing God, or we're going to just... Uh, well, Frankenstein was exactly the opposite. Here, that this intelligent creature was created and uh, well-motivated and uh, prejudiced people destroyed it. So it was a morality tale, which is usually misinterpreted. But um, anyway, then there was a little vacuum, but uh, between H.G. Wells and those people in uh, Aldous Huxley, so forth, in the early 20th century. But they, just as I was running out of them, then, then a new generation appeared with Isaac Asimov. John Campbell, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction, uh, started to write in the 1940s, 30s and 40s. And uh, by accident, I happened to be in just the right place. I, Isaac Asimov lived nearby. And when I started to, uh, that group to, to make robots and things like that, Isaac was around to discuss it. He refused to come to the lab to see them, and I wondered why, and he said, oh, well, I, I'm writing about really intelligent robots of the future. <laughs> and 
I'm sure that if I came and saw the clumsy ones that you guys are making, it would spoil my... Uh, Imagination. Right, and <laughs> I reluctantly agreed that he was right. <laughs> uh, that reminds me to my interview with Daniel Wilson, who wrote a book, How to Defeat uh, um, uh, a Terminator kind of robot uprising. So, for example, how do you escape from a robot? You just walk away very slowly, he <laughs> said. <laughs> Uh, anyway, what's your take on the technological singularity? Um, well, there's progress. And I've been watching it slow down for the last eight or ten years. So I'm a little bit not less optimistic about when it will happen. Very interesting. So you, you think it's decelerating rather than accelerating? Well, in artificial intelligence, it's certainly... Um, well, because of this phenomenon that very few uh, young people who are show promise have been able to get jobs. So uh, I'm not... I haven't seen very much progress in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. What about examples such as Watson, such as uh, Siri on our phones or Google Translator and many other such, quote, artificial intelligence system? Well, Sy Siri is pretty good, but it's quite old. But isn't it improving constantly? I don't think it knows that you can pull things with a string, but you can't push them. Uh-huh. I see. I but see. It's imp they're improving a bit, but not in the way that they were in the 60s and 70s, 70s and early 80s. So let's say on the one hand you have people like Ray Kurzweil who very bravely have published a timeline of the way he perceives <laughs> the future would unfold with respect to that. And on the other hand, you have skeptics who say that artificial intelligence is kind of like fusion. We're always 30 years away from it, but it, we're never any closer. Whereabouts do you stand on that? Well, it depends. I think it depends on how many smart people get to um, work on it. And it's hard to predict. Because I would never have predicted that there would be fewer people working on AI now than 10 years ago but there are no jobs. Mm -hmm. There might be 20 people working on Watson, but 20 years ago there were 100 people working, or maybe 200, working on artificial intelligence. And now I think there's half as many. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the push and the pull of, with a string as, as one of the indicators of how smart an artificial intelligence system is. Let me ask you about the Turing test. Do you think that that's a good test or is it too human specific to be any good or bad about evaluating the intelligence of an artificial intelligence? The Turing test is a joke, uh, sort of, uh, about saying a machine would be intelligent if it does things that uh, an observer would say must be being done by a human. So it it was suggested by Alan Turing as as one way to uh, evaluate a machine, but he had never intended it as being the way to decide whether a machine was it was it was really intelligent. So it's not a serious serious question. I see. So, Dr. Minsky, what would you say to any young person who today is interested in doing research in artificial intelligence? What's the best advice you can give them? Well, there certainly still are uh, plenty of opportunities to, to uh, stay in the academic world and teach computer science. There are 
um, lots of jobs in industry to develop applications of artificial intelligence, but it's hard to find uh, opportunities to do basic research. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure what kind of advice to give. Uh, don't give up is the main, main piece of advice. Don't give up. I like that. And what do you say to people who, like Professor uh, Gary Marcus, for example, are suggesting that the path towards artificial intelligence will be a, not a result of neuroscience, but at the crossroads between psychology and neuroscience? By bridging the two sciences, he claims, is the best approach to artificial intelligence. I'm neutral about that. I haven't seen much. There was a lot of progress in a subject called cognitive psychology in the 1960s and 70s, but I haven't seen it developing very well in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. So it seems to have cooled, cooled down. Well, his take was that much of the investment was taken by neuroscience and there were, therefore, in his point of view, just like you said, there was not enough research in artificial intelligence. For him, the money went into artificial intelligence and neuroscience and there was none left for psychology. That was his argument when I interviewed him on the show. What do you think about that? Well, I think artificial intelligence has been the main progress in psychology. I don't think psychology itself has progressed much, but uh, I might, I could, I could be wrong about that, and there could be major theories that just haven't become popular. Mm -hmm. But, but I haven't seen them. You keep telling us about the importance of theories. Why do you think that the theory, having a theory, is the crucial thing on the way to accomplishing that task? Well, a good example is that there's now a interesting <clears throat> movement to spend a billion dollars making a map of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Dr. Henry Markram's. Whatever it is, there are several of them. And I'd say there's a 98% chance that they will not map the right uh, aspects of the nervous system that they'll need to understand how it works. What they should do is spend their billion dollars on the housefly or the drosophila and make sure they understand it thoroughly before wasting money on wrong theories of what to map in the human brain. Very interesting. Because they might, uh, they may cause a 50 year waste of discouragement. If that, if that project doesn't produce much, it would cause great delay. Oh yeah, that reminds me to something that you said yesterday during the conference. You said we had a lot of bad theories that became very popular in the 70s. Well, or, not the, or the 80s. Well, recently. Recently, okay. <clears throat> the current um, ways of trying to represent the nervous system in terms of probabilities, I don't think are, are much of an advance over what we had 50 years ago. Perhaps you're referring to whole brain emulation? No, I'm referring to probabilistic uh -huh. uh, models of, of learning. I see, I see. Well, Dr. Minsky, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Let me ask you the very last question that I always ask of guests on my show, and that is, what is the final message that you want to send out to people who would watch this half an hour interview with you? If they were to take one message from you today, what would you like that to be? Well, I'm not interested in everything, and um, if uh, I'm really interested in good researchers and helping them get on the right path, and as far as what I've learned from my own career is uh, find the person who whose thinking you admire most and uh, Go and meet that person and uh, see if you can uh, copy him.
singularity.